In the last video, we ended up with a plot like this, where I said the means were some values that we gave names, beta naught and beta naught plus um, beta one to. We gave these means names, but we didn't actually do the calculations of the uh, means or of the confidence intervals at all. So in this video, we'll go about making a more sophisticated plot representing the two sample t-test and calculating the means and the confidence intervals for each mean ourselves. So this is the most applied video we've had yet, which is why I'm leaving this video as optional since this course is predominantly theoretical. We're going to start with this line of code, but I'll put it into a new notebook here. And we're going to use the library dplyr, which if you don't have, you should install. And later, we'll use the library ggplot2, which is a very sophisticated plotting library. And if it's not installed on your machine, you should install with code like that. So I'm going to go through this rather quick, and I'm going to leave it to you to piece apart the different aspects of this code since none of it is terribly confusing, but it looks like a lot when we do it all. But hopefully, if you do it in pieces, you'll see what's going on a little bit better. So in order to calculate the group's means, we should start with code like this. This operator reads percent greater than percent. And it says, take whatever is on the left-hand side of the operator and pass it into the function on the right-hand side. So we're essentially saying, take the data set carnivores and group it by superfamily. Now take that grouped data frame and calculate some summary statistics. That is, we're going to summarize that grouped data set. So I'm going to start out with um, n for the sample size. I'm going to name it capital N, and we're going to calculate uh, the function little n. We're also going to call the function mean on fb, because that is indeed our y-axis variable. So with just this code here, you can see we have our sample sizes, 57 and 55, for the respective groups. And we have the means. I said in the previous video it was about 65. I was close. And about 50. I was a little off on that one, but not too much. So it's pretty easy to get the means and the sample sizes. But now I'm just going to string some commas in here of some extra bits in order to calculate the confidence intervals. And this is the part I'm just going to kind of lay out and let you piece together now that you see the structure of the code. So we need some number of standard errors. So now we can go about calculating the standard errors. And then we just need to create lower bounds and upper bounds for our confidence intervals. And other than that small typo, which you can see happens to the best of us, there is a new data frame that includes all of our summary statistics. We have our means. We have our standard deviations per group. We have our standard errors per group. That's the standard deviation of the distribution representing of the distribution of the sample means. And here are the lower ends of these bars. You can see for caniformia, the lower end of the confidence interval is basically 41, this one here. And the upper end of the confidence interval is basically 90, right there. And the lower bound for the confidence interval for feliformia is just below, closer to 30 there. And the upper bound is just in the 60s there. So this plot is good and all, but it's not very sophisticated. So we're going to take that data frame we just created and use the library ggplot2 to make a much more sophisticated plot. We'll start with ggplot. So 
So we'll create a base plot with nothing on it. And we're going to add to it a box plot using the data set carnivores. That's the original data. And we're going to put super family on the x-axis and SB on the y-axis. And that alone is enough to get us a nice looking plot, though I prefer less ink on the page. And there we have it. Now, one better than box plots is a violin plot. This is essentially density plots turned horizontal and grouped by your x-axis variable. In this case, we have some categorical variable. But what this is really missing is the equivalent of this plot, which represents the sampling distributions themselves. So I'm going to add some layers to this violin plot such that we can see a visual representation on the same plot of both the original distribution from which our data came, that's what we're currently looking at, and the distribution of the means themselves for each group represented as a confidence interval. So I'm going to use the geometry of an error bar. And this time, our data set is going to be DF stats, which we just created above. And aesthetically, I still want super family on the x-axis. So I'll say oops, x equals. And now I want to put the endpoints of the confidence intervals. So I'll just do the lower bound and upper bounds. Now, I've done this before, so I know that I want the width of these bars to be relatively small. Otherwise, they'll stick off way outside the violin plots, and it's going to look funky. So the only thing I'm really missing here is the points themselves representing the means. But that's not too bad to get. So we'll just add the geometry of a point on the x-axis superfamily once again. And on the y-axis, we're just going to put m, because that is how I've represented means. So there is our one sophisticated plot, which represents both the original distribution the data came from as violin plots, and the sampling distribution of the sample mean as confidence intervals, and also shows the means of the two groups themselves. You can still see there is quite a bit of overlap between the two groups mean brain weights. So in this case, there is not much evidence to indicate that the different means are very different.